confirm with YouTube to make sure that we're live, and then I'll tweet it out. So there should be a bit of a delay before. And here we go. We are live. Awesome. So we'll take a second for everyone to get here. I'm going to go tweet it out now. And welcome, everybody, to Prudent Reads number two, our monthly little book club that we've got going on here. And uh, I am joined today by Mr. Raging Mandrill, who is making his first live stream appearance ever, which I'm very thankful that he's here. And of course, I'm joined by DC Perspective. Welcome both. What's up? Hello. Hello. Uh, so the book that we picked today or for this month to read was Samuel P. Huntington's famous 1996 book, The Clash of Civilizations and the Remaking of the World Order. Now, I had not heard of this book until DC Perspective had brought it up in a uh, live stream conversation a few months back. And uh, since then, I've purchased the book and I've enjoyed it very, very much. It's been a good read, and so here we are to, to talk about it. But I thought I would share with you all um, and the audience what started it all, which was that Huntington originally wrote this thesis and with the concept of the Clash of Civilizations as a article in Foreign Affairs magazine back in 1993. So we're going to go share that with you all. I'm going to load it up here on JSTOR. And should be available for you all to see now. And the one thing that I thought was interesting, because it's a it's a 28-page uh, essay here. It's a quite well thought out. But I wanted to start by taking this line at the very bottom here for you all to read. Westerners tend to think of nation states as the principal actors in global affairs. They have been that, however, for only a few centuries. The broader reaches of human history has been the history of civilizations. In a study of history, Arnold to Toynbee identified 21 major civilizations. Only six of them exist in the contemporary world. And I think this is one of the more important things for us to take a look at to start off, is that um, uh, Huntington, I think, identifies rather accurately the issue that we look at things primarily from a Western perspective in terms of nation state actors. And uh, that is not necessarily the case. I mean, it is now in terms of realist foreign policy, and it has been more or less since the Treaty of Westphalia in terms of how we in the West look at nation states. But when we look at other national actors, especially nations whose borders have been carved up due to previous treaties and uh, Western and European colonialism, that's not necessarily the case. He believes that they are civilizational actors based on educational and, you know, civilizational, linguistic, cultural, ethnic boundaries that often transcend just a border. And this, of course, leads to what he calls clashes of civilizations through borderline conflicts and fault line conflicts. And most recently in the, in the article, he cites primarily the issues that took place in the Balkans with the collapse of Yugoslavia and what took place in the 1990s. So I, I think that that's a, a really good place that we can jump off and have a discussion about, which is the concept of civilizational actors rather than just nation states. So what do you guys think? Well, I think the idea is salient and, and prudent. Um, but the, the, I, I don't see a problem with it actually at all. And you missed something in there that probably the, one of the most important things was religion. And when you were describing what divides a people. Yeah. And, and we're so far away from this now because for the last 100 years or so, we were like fighting the Soviet Union or whatever in the last 70 years, whatnot. And so we became ideologically driven. And I heard someone the other day say that I think it was a neoconservative, <laughs> actually. It was somebody talking about how. We need to do. We need to spread democracy, and and I'm 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 sitting here and I'm like, how do they not get it? The world is not 
going to be crafted through the ideological lens anymore. And the people that are thinking that it even was in the 1900s when we were fighting with the Soviets are, are just confused because we were still allied with dictators and evil uh, regimes, technically, uh, in opposition to the Soviet Union. And so this lens which people see the world through ideological countries instead of um, groups of civilizations, is it, it's damaging to realist foreign policy or actual foreign policy. Yeah, I'd hasten to agree. And this is one of my, my biggest beefs with the neocons is, um, you know, they, they view the world through that ideological lens, but I'm much more of a, a Machiavellian style real politic person. Um, so when I see um, specifically with their position of, you know, we need to spread democracy by the sword throughout the world. I, I mean, Huntington is just, I think, utterly proven in this case, because, you know, not every nation and not every culture, not every people is going to be a ripe candidate for democracy. Um, and I, I think our foreign projects in the Middle East have essentially proven that correct. Well, and the, the funny thing about that is that in the book itself, um, one of the biggest chapters he is called The West and the Rest. And he sort of goes on to talk about Western universalism and how that is going to be an agitator for conflict rather than the idea of the traditional neoliberal and eventually now neoconservative idea that interventionism and uh, liberalization of markets brings about peace and democracy. Because unless the trade in itself creates interdependency and there's some understanding, all that you're going to do is antagonize the two parties involved. And he talks about this not just with Western interventionism into like Eastern Europe and trying to overcome the post-Soviet divide, but he also talks about it in other countries as well. He talks about in the book, and I'm, I know you guys know about this as well, is where he's talking about um, in the Caribbean, you have all those former colonies of uh, English colonies of plantations, islands, trying to create this economic cooperation sort of trade union with former Spanish colonies and the work that has been done has been significantly held back, and this was in 1996, about, you know, they can't get over the linguistic and cultural differences between, you know, being an Anglo colony and a Spanish colony. And so this idea of trying to universalize values, which has been this Western concept for at least the last hundred years, has only been antagonizing the very essence of how people identify both as a culture and as a civilization. So true. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, like, yeah, like, I don't, I don't know what to say. Yeah. I, I, to me, just Huntington really outlines, I think that while the nation state concept is definitely important, especially when we look at modern statecraft and maybe in a realist perspective, but failure to identify a lot of the key issues of how people, you know, I identify internally because Huntington outlines that I think in chapter four, that we all have these competing identities, whether it's the nation, whether it's the religion, the faith, our service, our, our, our occupations, they all compete with one another. And it's the overarching uh, identity that allows us to function, you know, in these societies with higher and higher numbers of populations. And um, which of course, later he goes on and talking about the West um, in a very Spangler esque fashion about Western decline. Yeah. And um, I and I think that that brings us to to Huntington's important part of the beginning of the book, which I think to me, the central thesis of it was, is that if the West wants to continue to maintain its hegemony, even with the the wake of changing demographics, the of demographic booms in other countries and those who are now trying to be competing hegemons, whether that's in Japan, China and others one must recognize its civilizational value. And I think my favorite line out of the book was that for the West, specifically the United States and the United Kingdom, is that Western culture is the Magna Carta. It's not the Magna Mac, referring to a Big Mac. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that was one of my favorite lines in the book. <laughs> I mean, that's just literally, literally just the utter refutation of, you know, conservative incorporated... <laughs> Well, another another really good refutation in the early parts of the book is when he says, and I'm reading from the book here, the um, he says, the unfortunate truth and these old truths cannot be ignored by statesmen and scholars. For people seeking identity and reinventing ethnicity, enemies are essential and the poten and potentially most dangerous 
amenities occur across the fault lines between the world's major civilizations. The central theme of this book is that culture and cultural identities, which at the broadest level are civilizational identities, are shaping the patterns of cohesion, disintegration, and conflict in the post-Cold War world. So that's, that. I mean, he lays out the theme pretty, pretty flatly. There's no you know, English teacher having to read into the color of the blinds to understand the metaphysical nature of the book. I mean, he tells it to you right there. It's that, look, if you want identity, you're going to find enemies. You're going to have to find um, your cultural identity. And there are going to be conflicts among the civilizations when stuff like this happens. And we're already seeing this play out since the 90s, right? Right, right. And that's one of the biggest uh, things that I was thinking about with regards to that is that um, – those who are going, you know, when you talk about things like Schmidt's friend versus uh, foe distinction, um, it's going to make sense for you to ally with people who are closest to you. And this is one of the reasons why I think that the United States uh, should probably um, be greater friends with, um, say, Russia against China, if that was um, a foreign policy matchup that we'd have to make. I mean, at least Russia would be a partially westernized power um you know it's, it's, it's in that weird position that hunting inputs where you're uh, uh, like a, a duopoly there so well <clears throat> I, i'm kind of glad that you brought up russia because russia uniquely is i think what huntington describes is what he calls a lone country and i'll take it from the book here it's uh page 136 of my copy on in the chapter clash of civilization um the cultural reconfiguration of global politics he says quote a lone country lacks cultural commonality with other societies. Ethiopia, for example, is culturally isolated by its predominant language, a Homeric in the Ethiopian script, and its predominant religion, Coptic Orthodoxy, and its imperial history and its religious differentiation with largely Muslim surrounding peoples. End quote. I think that that is a great way to kind of apply it to Russia because historically, Russia has always been uniquely its own nation in part because. It's not entirely European, but at the same time, it longs to be part of the Europeans, especially once you have Catherine the Great come in with its reforms. Um, and so Russia does sort of act as that lone country that makes it harder to engage with on a global scale. Yeah, and, and don't forget uh, the westernizing influence of Peter the Great, especially too, before that. Um, yeah, it's kind of, Russia's in a very strange position um, due to it, the duality of its nature. And that's why I'm kind of thinking like, well, if the West is to fall in the Spenglerian fashion that we're talking about right now, I mean, Russia probably would, ironically enough, end up saving the, you know, repositories of knowledge and that sort of thing. I, I really am sympathetic to that. God willing. I mean, honestly, because, you know, what else is there really? We're going to have preserve the knowledge of all mankind. I mean, if, if the West does fall, then, you know, we're going to be in a lot of uh, a lot of trouble. Well, the, the question becomes at that point is uh, the, the nature in which we decline. Right. Yeah. Um, so with that and being said, let me pull up this. Uh, I, I tweeted this out, I think, yesterday, and this was a good quote, and I think that pri primes us for the conversation about what will, you know, in terms of civilization and how we should engage, what that looks like. So let me uh, pull it up for us to take a look here. There we go. So here's the image itself. Um and I, it's a good little quote here that I think is important to read, uh, talking about, you know, the, the, the decline debate. In many important respects, it's the United States' relative power, power will decline at an accelerating pace. In terms of its raw economic capabilities, the position of the United States in relation to Japan and eventually China is likely to erode still further. In the military realm, the balance of effective capabilities between the United States and a number of growing regional powers, including perhaps Iran, India, and China, will shift from center towards the periphery. Some of America's structural power will flow to other nations, and some, and some of its soft power as well, will find its way into the hands of non-state actors like multinational corporations. Well, I'll wow. leave that up there for you to look at. <laughs> yeah. That is, that is basically happening right now. Uh, exactly. Um, and I mean, that even further, and what's funny is that throughout that entire section of, the, of that chapter is that it's nothing but just quoting 
and referencing Spangler. And um, I know when I first announced that we were going to be going over this book, I had someone, I can't remember who it was. It might've been you, Michael. It could have been someone else um, talking about like, yeah, after this, you need to just read Spangler's decline of the West and go from there. <laughs> yeah. Right. So that, that'll, that'll be uh, next on the poll after we go over bronze age mindset in a couple of weeks. But uh, and yeah, and, and I just think that how prescient, cause this was just, this was written almost 30 years ago. And we're, we're now seeing American soft power in the hands of multinational corporations. I mean, Google and Amazon and Twitter wield as much power as a small nation state with a, I would argue, with a nuclear armed military. And so we're, and that's where we're at, is that we have these institutions that are private, quote unquote, private companies that are propagating universalism on the basis of what we would consider the West, or as Darren Beatty likes to call it, the the globalist American empire, the the big gay. Yeah, I, I mean, it's almost it's almost sad because you, I almost feel like it, the the West, at least in its universalist form, needs to to decline in order for us to to move forward with um, a revival or a rebirth, um, and you know that's going to be an exceptionally painful process. Well, I mean, I mean yeah. go ahead. Uh, well, I wanted to. No, you go, you go, because I was going to. Oh, what well, what I was going to say was is that um, the the problem is is that the we are stuck in this orthodoxy of of, of universalism, and I think if we're going to go back to quoting uh, German, you know, political theorists that. Uh, Carl Schmidt said it best. This is that really the things really began to go to hell when we started talking about legal positivism and or positivism. And that's kind of where we're at now is that we have this positive notion that the rule of law is going to be applicable to all things, despite the fact that there are so many other cultures and so many other peoples whose, you know, beliefs are antithetical to our aspect of this legal liberal universalism and Huntington talks about it in the book too when he talks about um like the Islamic resurgence where he's just like they're not trying to modernize Islam they're trying to Islamize modernity and I think that that is way more telling of how we need to be engaging with other uh, other peoples because I mean Huntington laid it out you know almost 30 years ago he's just like yeah the, the Middle East is going to try and you know, Islamize modern modernity. We're going to see a, a, an increasing rise of, of Islamist parties, the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt. He says Turkey will most likely go that way, despite the historical ramifications of Ataturk. And, and I, I mean, mean, here we are now. Like, the I crazy mean, thing er, is that that's er, exactly Erdogan's a nationalist happening. Islamist. Right. That's exactly yeah. what's happening. And that was one of the most salient things in the book to me, reading the whole thing, is knowing what we know now about Turkey, the way it's gone. And versus what he was saying about Turkey, I was like, man, you know, this is um, this is spot on. You know, Turkey had really two options going forward. It was try to keep at the hills of Europe and be their little lapdog and try to appease them or fulfill its rightful role as a core state in the Islamic civilization. And that's the path that's going down, which, you know, good for them, right? Well, I see almost as they, they got whatever maximum level of benefits that they could from the westernization under Ataturk. And now that, you know, the maximum benefits have been achieved, they've essentially started going down the um, path of, you know, where they actually should be going, which is the Islamist path. So um, on a different note, I, I almost I'm glad you brought up Turkey because um, I look at Turkey and I, I see parallels, at least some parallels with the West right now in which you have an elite class, which is, uh, you know, forcing a s separate value system, one that's alien to the populace. And um, it, it almost gives me a little bit of hope. It's almost a little bit of a white pill because, you know, once, once it turns out that um, either the maximum level of benefits from the new ideology, um, you know, that's implemented, you know, we gain those benefits and then the, the, the costs are, um, uh, I guess you would say just, you know, too much to bear. And then, you know, the basic, what I'm trying to say is the populace is eventually going to not put up with this stuff and, and it's, it is eventually going to get better. That correlation to America uh, runs, runs thicker than you probably think. If you look at the map of the election in 2017, which was um, voting for Erdogan and his ability to maintain his position of leadership or whatever, um, 
throughout the term limits, it was uh, it was a divide between the coasts and the heartland of the country. So the heartland was uh, voting yeah. for him, and the coasts were against him. So there is this really Western educated elite in like Ankara and um, Istanbul, and then in the heartland, it is obviously a very pro nationalist Islam resurgence type stuff going on. And so it yeah, draws yeah. a parallel more than most people think. Yeah, it's it's almost a white pill because looking at the way Turkey is going right now, I mean, yeah, they don't have the problem of mass migration, so they don't they don't have to deal with that specifically. Um, but it, it's just it, eventually that sort of universalist Western values are are going to be rejected. And I think Islam has, you know, at least in the areas where Islam is already established, they're going to um, have an easier time resisting that. Whereas the West, the universalist system has essentially already won. So it's much more difficult to resist. Um, although I will say that, you know, from a the comparing the Ataturk situation with, you know, the modern West situation, I would say that um, the West in terms of uh, technological benefits and, and all of the other things that you get from Westernization in the early 20s, um, that actually does provide you with a tangible benefit where I, I just don't see any benefit from wokeness at all in, in any form. Um, so it's, you know, it's just eventually this, this thing is going to um, be proven not to have any real, real, you know, benefits to the population at all and just going to get better once once it's proven beyond a doubt that it's detrimental. Well, keep in mind that wokeness, at least in a historical sense, wokeness is simply the evolution of our current form of universalism, especially that we see out of traditional liberalism. Um, you know, there's... Oh, right. To, to take a to, to quote Carl Schmidt once again because I feel like he's really applicable here the concept of humanity is especially useful ideological instrument of imperialist expansion and in it's an ethical humanitarian form it is a specific vehicle of economic imperialism here one is reminded somewhat of a modified expression of uh, proud Hans whoever invokes humanity wants to cheat to confiscate the word humanity to invoke and monopolize such a term probably has certain incalculable effects, such as denying the enemy a quality of being human and declaring him an outlaw of humanity, and a war can thereby be driven to the most extreme inhumanity. End quote. That's a that's a Schmidt quote, really. That I is a Schmidt that, that, it, time. I, that is a Schmidt quote, but I feel like it's incredibly applicable now when we talk yeah. about universalism because what is it? America's greatest export right now is currently the culture war, and we are now trying to see a cultural expansion of, of wokeness through it being exported elsewhere. That's why I, I see the lovely meme where it was showing. I don't even know if it was real or not, but you know, I, I, I couldn't help but chuckle when someone's painting the uh, trans rights flag on a bomb. On a on a, a military aircraft like that. That's where we're at. That that's our current form of universalism. It went from the human rights and democracy of the post Cold War of the 1990s, the Bush era, and now we have a social form of universalism where we have now in this idea of being woke. And that's where we're at. And I hate the. Uh, that I think we lost DC perspective. Oh yeah, try again. Um, something that Keith Wood said. Um, you know, all of his problems, whatever. Uh, he said that the American empire no, no longer operates through bayonet and gun, but rather through extra large, you know, dildo and McDonald's arches. And I think that's incredibly true. It's like this cultural aspect shifting from, you know, soft power, technically, uh, from, from hard power going from this over imperialism of the European Union, or not of the European Union, but of the United Kingdom and the British Empire to this kind of soft power of, um, subversion in the culture and under you saw this clip the other day of the pakistani tribesmen eating pizza hut for a youtube video oh yeah they were trying out uh pizza hut and like energy drinks yeah no I, I didn't watch it but i saw it and and you know i think that's pretty much what we're dealing with when it comes to american imperialism at this point well hunting to, to go to circle back to the book it, huntington talks about that he's just like the, the problem with uh, Western culture being seen as, you know, n not for the Magna Carta, but for the, you know, the Magna Mac, as he, he described it, is, is that eventually it is going to be a sad day when the West realizes that its culture is nothing but this sort of consumerism 
And, you know, because if your culture is nothing but Big Macs, blue jeans and fatty foods, then what are what is it to say about you as a people? And what is it to say about you when you're trying to export this elsewhere, when you're denying history, religion, language, ethnicity? Well, essentially, you're basically the bad guy, as far it, as I can tell. Exactly. You are the evil empire. And, um, well, let's put it this way, right? Okay, so when we're transitioning to soft power, and, and Michael's comment here got me thinking, and... Um, and when you're transitioning to soft power, eventually there's going to come a point where no longer is that sort of, you know, subversive soft power going to actually work, um, especially in like if you have like a violinist take over the United States military. Um, eventually people are going to catch on to that or the United States is actually going to get involved in some foreign conflict with a second tier power and it's going to lose and lose hard. And, if, you know, when that happens, you know, this whole, you know, global empire thing will crumble. It'll almost be like the um, Russian conflict with Japan uh, in a similar in a similar way, kind of marking the. the... Oh, you yeah, cut out there for a second. For a second. Yeah, we lost you again. Yeah, I don't know why that's happening. My Internet's having a rough one. It would almost be like when Russia lost against Japan. Are you referring to the. Uh... Japanese, Japanese Russian War in 1905. Yeah, I believe he is. Yeah, it would be okay. very similar, I think, in 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 that we look to that conflict as really a turning point for um, Russian dominance in a lot of ways. And I think Spe that it would. Speaking of the 1905 revolution, um, just on a tangent, how likely is it that the events of January 6 will turn out to be a 1905 revolution for our cause? Uh it's uh th see th this is where i i i'm not too sure in, in part because i i mm. adhere to the mold buggy and view that what the the, the left slash that what the cathedral kind of wants is the kick the dog so it bites and so you can put down the dog kind of situation um and so we're, we're already we're seeing these endless you know hearings and we're the these domestic terror bills we we now have a government that is inclined to say that like anti-government extremism is an international problem i know that i think it was the fbi the other day on capitol hill saying that like white you know supremacy terrorism is an international problem which just makes yeah. me think that there are other foreign intelligence agencies that are also glow in the darks but i mean I, to me, I don't know how much of what the sixth will represent other than just a excuse for the powers to be to, to clamp down. And the, the, the thing is, is that you're now in a situation where the idea of like, well, we have the guns and it will not matter because you have district attorneys that have been, you know, uh, put in with these million dollar cash influxes from dark money groups to be in power to prosecute you. Just look at what they did to the McCloskeys for simply waving their firearms in self-defense. It right. will be incredibly difficult to have anything that would serve as that kind of parallel. Yeah. Right. I'm just also saying, you know, um, um, they're, and again, we don't really have a sort of, uh, you know, um, uh, Russo-Japanese war with the exception of maybe the war on terror which I, I consider to be either a lost war or a war, that, a war that's in progress of being lost um, but short of that I mean you don't really have any sort of real like big discrediting event you know where you, the cathedral actually takes a massive L and has to you know reestablish its credibility and yeah, I think you're correct, Prudentialist, about the cathedral attempting to kick the dog until it bites. Although um, uh, academic agent in AA were talking in their stream um, on the fourth turning, uh, I think a couple of days ago, and I, they were confused by this. And I think my opinion of this situation is just, it's kind of the same thing with they're kicking the dog and et cetera, but it's almost like they're just, they're trying the old tactics, the old tricks, but they're not really working the way that they used to. Um, they're, they're almost in like this weird place where, um, they're not exerting, they're like in between soft power and overt hard power. Right. And so they're, the more they ex exert hard power, the more, um, it's, you know, it's not going to be, I guess the cathedral's most effective tactic, you know, because they can't boil the frog. Mm -hmm. It's, it's a very weird situation. I will grant you that it's, it's odd. 
it is certainly an odd situation to be in. And uh, keep in mind that it's not that uh, what's the word yeah, word I'm looking for? Uh, losing, as uh, Ouchie says, uh, losing war on terror implies its end, and I don't think it will be. And it's, if anything, the war on terror will simply just transition from a war on international terrorism to domestic one. And what we're seeing now, yeah. uh, especially out of the State Department, is been conversations about how do we integrate the, the the Western universalism that we were talking about earlier into our foreign policy. And they were talking about racial equity needs to happen here at home in order for it to happen abroad. And we're, we're sort of, again, creating this mechanism of we must have democracy abroad, we must have democracy at home, and now we must have equity at home. Um and equity abroad and that's that's kind of where we're at <laughs> and the difference is when we were saying we must have democracy abroad in the 90s and early 2000s we had democracy at home but now in the eyes of these people we don't have equity at home we don't have racial equality at home so what does that mean that means they have to first purge the body before you can change the world right got to fix yourself fix yourself so. right right so it, it, in other words they're they're trying to achieve a, a form of internal stability before they can project power that's that's basic you know basic mm -hmm. domestic policy basic politics um, and, and, to, and to bring it back to Huntington when we're talking about Western decline one of the biggest things that comes from any sort of civilization that's in decline is a focus on internal affairs and fo and having international affairs become an issue of the periphery. And I think it was either Lou Rockwell or someone else, and I, I know that um, it's someone that Radlib likes to cite a lot, saying that war is indicative of the health of the state. And when we're not at war, like the state is not healthy. And there's this inward focus, and Huntington is very right to point it out, the moment that you start becoming more introspective on your politics internationally is a sign of surefire decline. Well, I can't disagree with that. <laughs> um, and, and Dan Normie pops off and he says, democracy just means having the U.S. media pick your leaders. Not just right. pick them, just fortify your election systems, just in yeah. the same way that the Obama administration spent like millions of dollars and sent his campaign advisors during the Israeli Kisnet elections. Right. Yeah. I almost get the feeling that the cathedral is just, it's, it's sacrificing the the mythology that that created it and sustained it for so long in exchange for um power in the real world well and have you have you read um moldbug's clear pill essays yet mandrill um i'm i'm really behind in my my uh, moldbug reading to be honest with you um I, I have like a stack of books that's like, just like ridiculously wow. high. You know? uh, um, he, he was writing in the clear, I think it was the Claremont Institute or the American mind. One of the two, All right. I think I read it in the American mind, but he talks about, cause you're talking about the sacrificing of its mythology. And that's kind of exactly what he's talking about in his clear pill essays is about this concept of the two story state is, is that, you know, nations are usually unified. And, and I mean, this is also what Huntington talks about, where he talks about that we're unified on these common mythologies, these common languages, these common ideas that hold these people together, especially in massive multi-million, you know, populations where you can't everyone get along because of, you know, Dunbar's number and all that. But um, uh, Moldbug talks about when you have these competing stories, these competing narratives of what makes a people a people, it's going to be incredibly difficult to get things uh, accomplished. And so the, the cathedral is attempting to supplant the traditional American mythology you have of, you know, these rugged individualists that unify and they were, you know, brought down by divine providence to establish a constitution and to establish a government of freedom and free people and land owning people to where now we are the civilization of civil rights. We're the civilization of 1965 and MLK and all that. And you're trying to see this erasure of the original narratives of what brought the nation together. And we're seeing that now being fought in the education system. So the West, and by the West more so, I mean here the United States, and by extension the rest of the Western world, because the United States exports a lot of the culture, we are seeing that wonderful divide over you know, uh, an identity crisis. And it is an existential crisis that will inevitably affect our ability as a people to exist on the world stage. Right. Um, but just to go back to the, the cathedral thing, I, I, I agree with what you said here, but the, um, the cathedral is a regime that relies on the mythology of liberalism to exist. 
right? So the more that it sacrifices its mythology of, oh, I'm going to be pluralistic, oh, I'm going to allow multiple points of view, and the more that it just simply just, you know, does outright doesn't allow other points of view from ever being represented or, you know, if it effectively um, manages to turn itself into a one-party state, its mythology is essentially dead. At that point, it's just, it's just power. And I would almost consider that to be, um, oh, I guess maybe Brezhnev would be the best um, um, example of that, mm -hmm. where the regime just goes out to outright hard power and just doesn't care about the mythology anymore. You know, like like the Soviet system is supposed to was supposedly supposed to help the working class, and oh well, now we have all these you know revolts in Eastern Europe against the Soviet state. Well, then Brezhnev just comes in and crushes everybody in the '60s. It's almost like that. So it almost feels like the cathedral system is on the decline. It, it could go totalitarian, and I really think that it might, um, but I, I'm not sure that that's the case necessarily. I almost, I almost uh, feel like it's it's just you know, uh, uh, decaying in a way. Well, as um, I, I think the important thing to take notice is, is Huntington talks about what the, the model of American decline is going to be the issue of um, a, a lot of soft power now being in the hands of non-state actors, so multinational corporations. And one of the biggest concerns that you'll hear from a lot of uh, traditional liberals and e even sock Dems and others is that um, the concern relies upon the power that these institutions have. And, you know, there are only a few categories away from what you would meet the traditional definition of a state as a state actor. And so Correct. You're, you're, you're going to be in a very interesting position, whether, whether or not it transcends to the, the traditional authoritarian model that we've seen in the past with, you know, individual well, sort of CEO, uh, authright types, but I think that the ideas that we're going to see put forward in the future, especially now that we have this power that's been decentralized, because that's how the nature of the cathedral is, is it's this sort of multipolar, multi, you know, faceted apparatus is, is um, there will be power that is going to be concentrated in certain areas. But the question becomes uh, the traditional checks that we see from, you know, e egalitarian liberal systems of government that come out of the Enlightenment, I don't think that they'll have a check on it. Mm. Uh, Michael says, there can be no moderation, no classical liberals successfully resisting them. Part of me wants to let progressive fail in international relations. And... I Go ahead. On that, I almost feel like um, you're you're not. It's okay. So you don't get liberals to to resist them. That's not their job, right? When you're trying to to take down a regime, and and um, <clears throat> I, I watched the um, the fall of eagles on the Bolshevik revolution, that the old BBC series from the seventies, mm -hmm. and I was I was watching the Bolshevik episodes, and I was listening to this, and. Um, Essentially, what you have to do is you you if you want to like take a, a regime, especially a regime like the cathedral, out. You you don't have to convince your opponents that you're right. It's also as much about convincing um, supporters of the regime to just you know stand aside and and do nothing as the regime falls. And that's almost how it, what I feel is happening with the cathedral. And I see this with people like. Um, Christina Hoff Summers and, you know, the, the Weinstein brothers and the Heather Hyings and the James Lindsay's of the world. Okay. So when, when those folks are all, you know, you know, not supporting what the cathedral is, is telling them, this is a good sign for us. I can see where you're coming from. Yeah. I, um, but I want to, let's, let's try and, <laughs> the absolute beginners, uh, let me try and uh, circle back here to, to Huntington. And because um, our, our conversation on civilization, I think, brings a really good way to start talking about some of the areas where he got right, what he got right and what he got wrong. And I wanted to start off by bringing up a map from uh, Strategic Forecasting, Strat4, and... Um, I thought that it would be a good one to discuss. So I'm going to share this on screen. And so this is his definition of the, the civilizations, the, the maps. 
He, he calls them Huntington's civilizational divides. Samuel Huntington car- categorized the world into nine civilizations, arguing that fault lines between the world shape international relations and serve as a driving force of conflict in the post-Cold War world. So he outlines the West being, you know, the United States, Canada, and a majority of Western Europe along the Warsaw Pact NATO lines. And I can't help but find his definition of Western to be slightly generalized, or at least overly generalized, because a lot of Huntington's analysis about civilizational and fault line conflict is really an examination of what happened in the 1990s, particularly with what happened in Serbia, Bosnia, and um, the collapse of Yugoslavia. But I feel like he fails to recognize a lot of the conflict um, that comes from different civilizations and different ethnic groups and peoples inside Europe, because I mean, the first half of the 20th century is based upon civilizational conflict inside of the West. You have sort of this Anglo versus continental view of, you know, how Europe yeah. should be ran, especially when you take a look at the first world war between Germany and the United Kingdom and, and especially their naval upbringing. Yeah, correct. And also don't forget the, uh, the Anglo uh, or I guess I should say the Catholic and Protestant divide along the North South axis in Europe as well. Um, Another problem that I, I see with this map, um, and he, I don't know, this map doesn't look like it's from the book, but I remember seeing in the book, he's got the, the civilizational divide um, between the Orthodox and Western civilization as basically splitting Ukraine in half. Like the Eastern third of Ukraine actually is uh, pretty Orthodox in civilization and pretty Russian. And it's funny that, um, and I, I view his thesis as correct in that regard because um, if you were to look at, say, election results in Ukraine in recent years, you would see basically the same thing, that, that the party line split is essentially along those lines as well. So it's very fascinating to see that. And yeah. um, oh, yeah. n- n- not, not to mention the uh, um, American influence that came with Ukraine in trying to oust President Yukonovich in 2014. Yeah, what would be described as the fault line runs straight through Ukraine. Yeah. Um, between Orthodox and Western civilization. And that's why you see this um, conflict there as well. And he predicted in the book, he said, uh, it's predictable that Russia will try to exert exert force on uh, Eastern Ukraine. And that's exactly what happened in 2014. Yeah, and and that just goes with um, the usual Russian desire for uh, buffer states that it controls. Um, you know, Russia's defense policy largely is based around, um, you know, the um, idea of, you know, the usual Russian strategy of, okay, I, I exchange land and, you know, people for time. So, and that's essentially what they're trying to do. Um, I'm, I would not be surprised if um, if the global American empire were to collapse before Russia's demographic collapse, that Russia would actually start to um pick off the, some of those Eastern European nations or actually bring them into its orbit somehow into a, um, you know, a closer relationship. Well, we're, we're already seeing that now to a significant degree. I mean, between the United States um, pressuring with European union leaders over what's currently happening in Belarus, despite the fact that Belarus for the longest time has been ethnically Russian. Yeah. So, I, I mean, the, the buffer state strategy also, too, is a civilizational response to the West, based upon this map, at least, because post-fall of the Soviet Union, right, the United States had made several claims saying that we're not going to encroach upon what you believe to be state sovereignty, especially as we try to incorporate post-Warsaw Pact countries into NATO, and we pretty much go back on our word diplomatically and begin moving further and further east with NATO to a point now where we have NATO allies that are essentially on Russia's border. Right. And right. Norm Norm Eisen, a really good representative for the um the cathedral, this lawyer and former ambassador to Prague, who um Darren Betty Biet, Betty talks about a lot. He basically said um in this documentary that I watched a while ago talking about how uh Russian policy right after the collapse by Bush and Clinton was um was really bad because it basically solidified that we're not going to be friends anymore or we're not going to be friends. Very quickly, we went from, oh, the Soviet Union's gone. We can be friends now to instantly encroaching on their borders and not being very, 
I, I don't want to say friendly because of course we're not going to be friendly, but I guess like uh, approachable <laughs> as a per, as a as a country. And Russia very quickly got the got the message that hey, just you, you know you might be changed, but we still don't like you. And I I don't know why that was carried over um, into the 21st century. To be honest, I just don't know why. I do. Um, the in my view the the dis- Faisal of uh, Western liberals against um, Russia's um, current regime largely has to do because with um, it not un- being a universalist uh, regime, right? It's the same reason why the liberals in in prior to the uh, advent of the Soviet Union, why they would insist um, upon, oh, you have to have a, a liberal democracy in order for us to give you foreign aid um, to the white Russians. So, I mean, it's, it's kind of the same deal, right? They're unable to accept that um, somewhere another country is, you know, going to not have a, you know, overtly Western style democratic system. And yeah, I get that Russia does run elections, but, you know, come on, let's be real. Putin is not uh, leaving office anytime soon. Um, it's, it's closer to, I'll, I'll just put it this way. You know, the Orthodox Church is going to, to have a czar, basically, and, and Putin is essentially the, the new czar. Um, and, you know, Western liberals despise that. So I think it's really along an ideological line on that respect, why they don't like him. Well, I think um, Charlemagne said it best in his video that came out yesterday um, about no exit. This is that you do have the the aspect of Western universalism and people, they do not want exit as an option. That is why they they despise Peter Thiel and this idea of this neo cameralist state that he wants to put in the middle of the ocean with international waters where you can just dock your boat and be a citizen with no country except this little territory. Um, and the same thing easily applies to the, to the Russians is that you have a uniquely ethnic and based on the orthodoxy of the, the, of the church and... Um, I mean, they they can't stand that, and that's where we're, and we're seeing that now. Even even inside the European Union, the continental universalism of this great European project is being challenged. When we see them trying to put pressure on Poland and put it on Viktor Orban of Hungary and um, Sebastian Kurz of uh, Austria, and that's where we're at is these inter civilizational divides. Because I mean, it's a great. I think Huntington provides a very generalized outline of where we can see fault lines exist. But um, there needs to be more attention, I think, placed, especially on ethnic and religious fault lines within these countries, because these cultural differences exist in philosophy, which comes from the culture, which comes from the religion. And they don't, uh, at least in the book, I don't think Huntington puts enough attention on those things, especially inside the map that he draws out inside the book, as well as the one I have on screen. Yeah, bingo. Um I'll just add to that real quick and and by just saying uh, against the globalist hegemony, we probably should, um, even if they're from a different civilization, we should probably help them um, resist whatever it is that is Western universalism. I think this has been a major stumbling block for the right in recent decades um, is basically, oh, well, these people are ethnically and culturally different from me. So I'm, you know, going to let the, you know, universalism overrun them essentially, and this is uh, a huge problem. The the what we really have to do is make common cause with people who are, you know, the type of people who are for their own religion, their own ethnicity, their own culture, their own customs and traditions, regardless of of wherever it is, and just say, okay, well, we're going to to leave you be in your lands, and you know, as long as you help us resist this nonsense then you know we'll let you be in the future well it, it's the great con it's the great contradiction i think of western liberalism is is that um western liberalism holds the idea of individuality egalitarianism and self-determination amongst peoples as long as you think and act exactly the same way we do heaven forbid you think and act differently and self-determine in your own rights in your own ways and I think that that's the the greatest contradiction of the of the current system and how the regime operates. And eventually, that's going to come back and bite it in the ass. And that's a part what Huntington talks about when he talks about um, les revanches de Dieu, the uh, the revergence and resurgence of God. Is is that you know post fall of the Soviet Union, orthodoxy becomes the the consuming aspect of our society. 
um, at least in, in Russia and in former Soviet republics, because he calls, ironically, communism the god that failed, um, which is also the name of a book in uh, 1949 about some former communists that uh, give up um, communism in the party. But well, uh, uh, and, and might... ironically, we're, we're seeing the same thing happen here in the United States. And, and here's what I find interesting is that Huntington's analysis is coming here again, is that... Um, here in the U.S., we have this fortified election, and a majority of people on the right are beginning to see that, hey, this uh, this democracy thing, you know, Hans Hermann Hop, you know, hey, that uh, democracy, that kind of that god that failed, and what immediately starts coming out on all these articles after January sixth is this concern over Christian nationalism, and that's where we're at. So we are seeing the exact same sign of, re, you know, falling back, regression, revanche de Dieu, resurgence of God in the wake of what's happened. Because we have these secular institutions, these secular beings that have fallen and have failed in our eyes, either through fortification or through other means. So we revert back to what we know. We revert back to the faith. And that's why we're seeing all these articles come out saying, hey, religion is bad. Religion nationalism is bad. Christian nationalism is evil. And that's where we're at. We're seeing the exact same thing post-Soviet Union style happen right here in our own borders. Mm. That's interesting, too, that you mentioned that as post-Soviet Union style. It, it, I'm, I'm not aware of the dynamics of that. Is that... Um, after the fall of the Soviet Union, did uh, you see a, a bunch of, um, you know, amongst the Russian populist people um, returning to religion, and then there was a sort of institutional pushback against that? Well, I mean, other than the institutional pushback not being, uh, you know, ex-Soviet elites and oligarchs that, you know, had no meaning for religion, but Huntington outlines in the book when he talks about the, the resurgence of orthodoxy and the resurgence of religion is, is that... Um, leaders began to embrace it. And mm -hmm. we see that even in other areas like the Islamic resurgence is that these people are embracing Islam and embracing, you know, yeah. Western democracy through Islamism. And we're, we're seeing that now. I mean, Vladimir Putin has greatly embraced the, the, the Orthodox church and the faith. Um, and it helps identify with the Russian people. Uh, in the same way that here in the yeah. in the United States, I feel like you see a lot of right wing politicians in a sort of evangelical sense identify with Christ. Yeah, yeah and you're also seeing the same thing in uh, Poland and and Hungary as well. I know Steve Turley likes to talk about all that stuff all the time. <laughs> their birth rates, which is just it's <sighs> crazy, how just a little bit of incentivizing um, you can you know change things around. Steve Turley's my favorite cope merchant. <laughs> <laughs> Mine too. Worldwide <laughs> populist uprising. Yeah, I just, I, <laughs> I just, I wish. It's on the decline as uh, Trump. Yeah, a, a new conservative age. Tell me more, Steve. Tell me more. Give me that sweet <laughs> cope. <laughs> I remember finding um, him during the Le Pen elections in 2017, and I was like, Le Pen's going to win. And then I realized that he was full of crap. <laughs> I mean, I. Oh. I'd like to see what the National Front does in the next, uh, I think it's what, 2022 is the next French election? Yeah. Um, I'm curious to see what will happen because Macron has done the correct thing, and this comes back to Huntington, identifying civilizational and existential threats, is that he's like, oh man, we have turned France into the camp of the saints, and ergo, we've got we've to clamp down on this religious extremism in education. <laughs> And uh, he's pretty much taking a hard right stance on that. In a French context, yes, although he is still, um, I guess you would say that he is defending secular France from um, Islamic intrusion is how I would put it. Um, it's interesting that, that he has recognized the threat in that respect. And uh, I'm, I'm personally a cynic on that. I, I feel that he is um, kind of just doing it to outflank uh, Le Pen. And... Yes essentially um, talking a big talk and then we'll do not a whole lot when he's in office. Um, but it's, it's actually wonderful to hear them talk and actually recognize the problem um, because that is a significant shift of the Overton window towards our side, at least in France. Well, yeah, yeah, no, you're right. Uh, to, to me, I'm pessimistic of it that uh, if he does enact any sort of policy, all it's going to do is affect French Catholics and not French Muslims. 
that is also possible. That, as well. that is that is exactly what I'm banking on. Um, and this he, is from from to be to be fair, he has said it, um, the problem is Islamo leftism, and you're seeing not just him, but also um, I think some of his advisors were talking about this as well, um, which is interesting because when and when you see and I what was the article that I saw? I saw some article about uh, some school teacher, like arch leftist school teacher in the middle of nowhere, and you know talking about how this is a problem, and you know basically just saying, oh, this is bad, actually. This is really, really bad, and this is going to get worse if we don't do something now. So it's it's interesting um, to see how when there is actually a, a greater level of threat and almost a greater level of civilizational difference, um, because the differences between, I guess you would say, Latin America and the West are less than the differences between the Islamic civilization and the West. Um, so obviously that that greater amount of difference and that just you know the islamic drive um is going to to you know really sharpen minds in a way that uh, it doesn't really in the united states well the other thing to keep in mind and um it, of course is the historical thing because like um melfus i agree with you that he's he is still very much anti-christian he's a, he's a staunch secularist but i think the thing that huntington identifies about the civilizations having the shared commonality in the shared history is is that france historically has been a great bulwark for the traditional aspects of what we would call christendom for what was most of europe up until the enlightenment is that you know you have 732 you have the battle of tours pointers you have charles martel essentially holding off the advance of the moors and um from the iberian peninsula and the pyrenees mountains so france historically has been this bulwark against um, the encroachment of Islam into to what is considered the West by Huntington's definition and what has historically been Christendom. So I'm pessimistic, but at the same time, there is sort of this historical factor to keep in mind that civilizationally, France has done a lot to, to hold it off. And I think that perhaps there can be some good that can come from this. Yeah, I'm. I'm going to be the the optimist on this stream and say that uh, France will return to 732 and uh, kick the Muslims out again. So we'll see. Well, I mean, they're like what 20 percent of the population now. Good luck with that. Uh, yeah, short of something like um, a sort of um, like the uh, events post Reconquista in Spain, that's probably not going to be a possible. That more likely, I think, is going to be some sort of um, you know, minority rights recognition, and then um, you know, basically just in enforcing the culture on the Islamists in France through you know the power of the state, essentially, and the schooling systems. Yeah, because unless they go full Serbia and remove kebab, I just don't see it happening. <laughs> yeah. Um, but the other thing that I thought was interesting, because uh, we've been overall sort of just talking about some of the things that Macron, or not not Macron, Huntington gets right and things that Huntington gets wrong, um, is that uh, he placed a lot of interesting analysis, I think, on uh, China and Islam. Yeah. And I thought that was interesting, thinking that th these relationships... Um, that the China will cooperate closely with Iran and Pakistan and other, um, you know, Muslim, you know, you know. parts of the Muslim uh, civilization that he, he identifies. And I find that interesting because I don't think that that's necessarily panned out. Like, yes, China has been involved Ooh. in the middle East with the, his, their, their silk road initiatives. Yeah. But um, at the same time, I'm not sure how much of that is going to be just inter-civilizational relationships, especially when China, at least for right now, has been so adamantly anti, you know, religion, uh, you know, and historically they've been anti-Christianity even, and now they're, they're clamping down on the Uyghurs and they're trying to ensure that terrorism doesn't happen within their own borders. So I'm yeah. not seeing the, the civilizational relationship that he's, you know, outlining. Well, no, it's not a civilizational relationship. I don't think, I think it's more of, um, uh, to me, the, the the Chinese and Islamist relationship is more of a pragmatic or practical one. Right. Mm -hmm. it, it, the Belt and Road Initiative essentially is, like, for example, China needs um, foreign naval bases. Um, so I know that they were 
like they have done quite a bit in terms of the Belt and Road Initiative um, for you know construction of ports. And I think uh, Robert Kaplan talks about this too in his books. Um, but they have essentially, and especially in Baluchistan and Pakistan, they um, they're essentially they build a port and they own it and it's theirs. So you know, right. they've well, done that yeah. basically all over Southeast Asia. I think that the Chinese, um, you know, position has changed a lot, and they they kind of described in the book, and he did talk about the Islam or Confucian Islamist alliance a lot, but I think that's kind of shifted from Islam Confucius to everywhere. You know, they're they're operating in Latin America and in Africa, and even in this, you know, Southeast Pacific island regions of the world, and and so the the alliance between islam and china was not going to be based on ideology or based on even anti-west sentiment but because these two religions confucianism and islam uh, or these two worldviews share a lot of the same grievances and this is from the book um these cultures offer a vehicle for expression of grievances for which the west is partly blamed a West whose political, military, economic, and cultural dominance increasingly rankles in a world where states feel they don't have to take it anymore. So it's a, it's just kind of like, oh, okay, I mean, I guess in our opposition to America, we're now going to be partners. Not really like we're going to be partners because we want to take on America, but because they're both opposed to America. So they're just, you know, it's like that comic by um, Stone Toss where the socialist finds himself standing next to the capitalist are the corporatists uh in the tug of war battle it's similar mm -hmm. to that yeah I, I i love that comic it's so good um yeah i i would say that's also however um yeah they don't ignore the economics especially for um in, in africa um that i think a lot of that is is essentially just the chinese are making moves in africa because they want the rare earth metals uh, for their weapon systems and um so yeah they're basically just using the economic um, in uh, incentives in Africa to get what they want. Yeah, and like Jonathan said in the comments, I mean, have you guys heard any Islamic criticism levied at China over what's happening to the Uyghurs? I mean, oh, I don't. Uh, no, Arabic, none at all. Any, none. Right. I haven't. I haven't seen any major Al Jazeera articles being shared around. So, well, the Qatari right. government has no problem with the Chinese silencing, you know, a offshoot brand of Islam that's not necessarily Shia or Sunni. I'm not necessarily surprised at all. Yeah. So another thing that um, Huntington got really right was talking about the formation of core states in Islam. And I was wondering what you guys thought about that. Because oh, he, he, he was basically saying that there wasn't going to be one for a while. And that's kind of played out. But I'm, I'm, I'm asking your thoughts on the core states in Islam. Right. So my opinion is um, Turkey is probably not going to become one just because it's it's uh, has been too westernized by the process that we've already talked about on this stream. Um, uh, so that conflict will need to get resolved before Turkey can uh, exert uh, outward influence. Um, Iran, I would say, and Saudi Arabia um, are obviously the two ones that uh, Huntian outlines. And I'd say that those two are the most likely candidates, and I don't know which one is going to to be the um, the hegemon of the Middle East in that respect. Um, Saudi Arabia right now probably has a better shot simply because it has U.S. backing, um, and it sell you know obviously the oil to the West, um, whereas Iran is a little um, more uh, distrusted abroad. Um, so, and of course, there's the uh, sectarian distinction there. You know, uh, Saudi Arabia is obviously Sunni and Iran is Shia. So, um, and the majority of the Arab world is, is Sunni and Iran is, is Shia. So, you know, I feel like Saudi Arabia has a slightly better chance of actually being the leading core state in um, the Middle East. Well, the question at that point becomes if, we, if you're going to get a main state actor, right? Because I think that... Um, as we talked about earlier about the, the Islamic resurgence, about those trying to uh, Islamize modernity, is, is that I think your, your two major competing powers, depending on how the United States acts in the next uh, few years, is going to either be, I, I would disagree, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to argue that Turkey is definitely a possible mainstay of, of Islam uh, for a main state. 
in part because it has entrenched itself now to be the ultimate leverage against Europe, i.e. the West, because it now has the pressure release valve with um, migrants. It has Russian military capabilities. It is increasingly entrenching its diplomatic relationships with other mainstay anti-Western leaders in the area, like Saudi, or, or like Iran, and like Syria, while still maintaining relatively decent relationships with anti-Iranian leaders in the area, like Lebanon, like Saudi Arabia, like Qatar. So, even though it, you know, it has quote unquote become too Westernized. Turkey is in a very unique position coming forward due to its Islamic nationalism of Erdogan, its military apparatus, and its diplomatic like leverage over the West to be one of the possible main states. Yeah, but, and but that's, let me that's, just say what my position is there. So I never said it was too Westernized. I just said that that the conflict, um, the internal conflict there the, between the pro-Western faction and the Islamist faction has to be resolved before they can move forward and I think, I, that, I think it's been resolved I think Erdogan yeah, has made it very too, clear that he that that faction's won yeah, yeah. I, I mean I, I'm not disagreeing there it's it seems very clear now um, but yeah essentially once the once that's been resolved then they'll be able to exert external influence so and, and they uh, already are I mean they're in Syria they're in Cyprus they're in Libya um, and I think I, I I do think that Turkey is going to be one of the core states and I don't think it's just limited to one core state you know is the, the culture of Islam or the civilization of Islam is rather large, all things considered. But, but yeah, and I, yeah. I'm not any any bets that uh, there isn't going to be multiple core states. I'm not sure that there's going to be a hegemon like either the the United States in the West or say Russia in Orthodox. I think right. it'll be a plurality. I think it'll it'll be more similar to say um, you know 19th or 17th. Uh, 18th century Europe, where there's going to be multiple competing powers, where they're roughly the similar um, um, levels of power, you know? Yeah, and, and, and Turkey will definitely be one of those mainstay powers, I think, alongside with Saudi Arabia, especially as long as the United States and other powers like the Chinese and the Russians have an interest in the in the Middle East, especially because as we continue to rely sort of on the petrodollar economic system for energy, um, uh, Saudi Arabia is going to be one of the main power players, uh, not to mention you have the Arab League, you have OPEC, and Saudi Arabia has been the primary leader in that area for the last 40 some odd years. Um, not to mention through the Trump administration, we have uh, essentially isolated Iran by getting virtually every other Arab state to normalize ties with Israel. Mm -hmm. um, which of course came at some significant concessions, but you now essentially have isolated a regional hegemonic power by creating this coalition of states to, to pretty much snuff it out if need be. See, I'm, I'm almost of a different opinion. Huntington talks about Israel and he says that in any case, because that's already a civilizational conflict um, in and of itself. Right. And he talks yeah. about the, the dynamics of civilizational conflicts. And one of the things that struck me was um, that these things that if they're if you achieve a peace, it is usually going to be temporary in nature. So if if that's true, that peace agreement that uh, President Trump managed to get between all these Middle Eastern countries um, and Israel, and basically just say, okay, we're going to normalize peace with Israel. I think that that's probably going to be temporary. I'm not sure how long it will last, but I'm not. I'm going to say it's probably going to be at least left less than 50 years. I wouldn't expect that lasting longer than that. I I expect it to last as long as it is pretty much Israel remains the only sole nuclear power in the area. I, I know that Pakistan has nukes. I know that Iran is trying to have a nuclear program and they probably do have nukes, but because of this agreement, the only thing that's really going to happen now is that the Saudis are going to feel emboldened and they've already talked about trying to buy nukes from Pakistan. I would not be surprised if the next big nuclear hot button di diplomatic issue is going to be the Saudis getting the bomb. And that's going to definitely change how the game is played in there. Yeah, agree. Um, but the other thing I wanted to pop off uh, or pop and show was um, this other picture from the book that I thought was uh, a good thing to uh, show. So here, let me here we go. Share that one. And this is uh, Huntington's Global Politics of Civilizations and Their Emerging Alignments talking about um, you know the, the civilizations that exist and how they're going to be 
uh, more conflictual and less conflictual in the next, yeah. you know, 30 some odd years. And you can see that the dark lines mean more conflict, the lighter lines mean less. And I thought that that was interesting. There's no relation between China and Africa. <laughs> or, yeah, I know. Yeah, and I think that that's the biggest thing that... That's, yeah, that's the big point, is that there's no conflict between China and Africa, because China's going to own Africa. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think yeah, Samuel yeah. predicted that. I really don't. I, I don't think... Samuel didn't talk too much about the African world and then uh, the, the cynic civilization, or China. Um, which I think is one of the bigger things that uh, Huntington missed out on because since what the early, the mid aughts, China has been the largest foreign direct investor in Africa and it's been almost consistent for the last 15 years. Yeah. Yeah. I think you, I think you, I think you could um, describe Samuel Huntington as a paleocon and whenever paleocon start talking about Africa, it gets messy really quick. So probably a better thing that he didn't. <laughs> <laughs> it's like bring back the empire <laughs> well i mean yeah. that was the in the beginning of the book that's the first thing that you know huntington talks about is just like listen like you need to acknowledge these socio-cultural and you know religious identities that exist that makes a civilization a civilization and then uh, he conveniently sort of sidesteps that when he's talking about the West, because I mean, if we're if we're going to talk about Western civilization, that uh, it has to include the ethnic question. And the United States and many European states are trying to do something that doesn't really function. The closest thing I can think of historically would be the Austro-Hungarian Empire from like 1848 to to World War One. Yeah, is, and that, that, is this vast multi-ethnic multilingual empire that is barely held together by a slim majority coalition of ethnic Austrians. Correct. Like, and that's where we're at. And I'm like, that didn't end well. <laughs> yeah, and, and to, to be very honest with you, I almost see a uh, separation in the United States as almost an inevitability at this point so for that simple fact alone. I mean, I just don't see, I mean, unless you have like a, a, you know, Mason red pill, you know, monarchy, you know, taking hold and basically saying, you know, no, actually, we're going to uh, make ourselves a new American empire here that's not global homo. I'm not sure that you, you know, that the American cook would survive in its current form. It definitely won't survive in its current form. But what happens after is a you know, matter of debate. Well, I mean, the other the other concern, though, right, about the whole Austrian-Hungarian empire, and, and Michael Nochter points this out in the comments, only took one bullet in Bosnia to pull down Austria, and right. <laughs> that's yeah. where we're at. And, and, yeah. and those, are, those are my favorite, that's my favorite example of a civilization, because I've been saying this even before I read this book. I mean, I've been saying this um, forever. It's like a, multi, a multicultural society like the hung, Hungarian empire can't really stand um, as, for as long as people pretend it can't. I mean, the Soviet Union is another good example of this, a country that is comprised of a bunch of different ethnicities has fell apart, um, you know, and people will blame that on communism and a lot of other things. But I mean, look at North Korea, they're still around, though they're being tied together through, you know, brute force. They're still around because they're North Koreans and that's it. They're not, you know, they don't have Muslims on their south and. Uh, well, I mean, I, I would be hesitant to make that analysis, though, to D.C., just simply just because so you have so many uh, groups in Belarus and other the, the the little Russian, the white Russians, like the Kievian Rus, all these things that historically have been, you know, ethnically Russian for centuries. It's just keep that yeah. in mind and making that comparison. Oh, yeah, actually, I mean, I guess. So I got two things to say here. So uh, Auchi says um, the Felix Konechny, I'm, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that right, wrote about civilizations before Huntington. Check out his book on the plurality of civilizations. I will have to check that one out because that might be a good counterpoint against the Huntingtonian analysis of decline in the West. Um, the second thing that I want to say is going back to the um, um, the dynamics of having multi-ethnic empires, um, the unfortunate and I, this is why I, another reason why I despise the neocons, right, is um, in our invasion of Iraq is when you have a multi-ethnic, multilingual, multi-sectarian, um, multicultural, um, I guess you would say nation, right, uh, how do you keep it together with except by some sort of authoritarian power like Saddam Hussein? 
you know. Well, I mean, I mean and, and this is not to, to interject there, right? But like, sure, authoritarian force is the is the sort of hard power way of doing it. But like, the soft power way of doing it, and sort of this is what Mold Bug talks about within his Clear Pill essays, is like you need to have a, a, a common unifying narrative, a common unifying ethos, sort of this shared historical history. And I mean, we have that, but at the same time, we're now declaring that evil because it's white. Yes, and we're implementing something much, much different. Anyway, um, I, I just thought that's interesting because, um, yeah, in, in with the Austro-Hungarian Empire, the comparisons between autocracy and, I guess, uh, Bathus dictatorship here, um, it's, it's almost like, you know, when you have that sort of um, level of distinction above a certain level of um, uh, multiculturalism in a society, you are unable to have enough, you know, trust levels where you can't form any sort of, you know, democratic governing coalition. You know, it almost has to be a sort of monarchy. Yeah. Uh, Melfis999 says hot take but the formation of various Russian splinter states from central Russia is because of western influence and the chaos caused by the destruction of the Russian economy after the USSR by the USA. Are you saying that's your hot take or something that we said was a hot take because I wholeheartedly agree with that like the the fall of the Soviet Union the more and more I keep reading on my geopolitics and history I kind of mourn not because I miss the Soviet Union but because the Soviet Union forced the United States and the West to be ideological and actually like stand for something and it wasn't just non communism it was like we have these values we actually have this aspect of liberalism that was not completely paused as it is now but i mean um i i i be, I, I begin to soon regret the fall <laughs> <laughs> well yeah yeah and this is what yeah. samuel said man at the beginning of the book and i read it at the beginning of the stream too a culture needs an identity oh, it cut out there a culture i was saying a culture needs a um identity and in order for an i to have an identity it needs an enemy and that's what samuel huntington said and i read it at the beginning of the um of the live stream and that's what this is that's what that was yeah no i and, and i agree like hunt the hunt hunting tony and analysis of just the we we the nation state like i mentioned in his article that he originally wrote in foreign affairs is just like it's naive to assume that we can look at things through state actors because not everyone has been a state actor. There's been these multi, you know, nation state actors that have been civilization, ethnic actors that we should take greater consideration of. Uh, Melfus says, since the USA did mass robbing of Russia during the fall of the USSR. Yes. Uh, we sure did. We did a lot of that. Uh, Jonathan Pohl says, uh, all empires have multi-ethnic populations. You can do a you reverse or affirmative action empire for a while like the USSR did from 1923 to 1936. Yeah, and I, I feel like we're kind of seeing that now. And that kind of reminds me a lot of what uh, you've been doing, Jonathan, on your channel when you're talking about bio-Stalinism and racial kulaks. Well, we're kind of seeing that now here in the U.S. Yep, it's absolutely terrifying. Although I will reply to Jonathan Paul by saying, you know, yeah, the, I would agree with you. All empires have multi-ethnic populations. Um, if you were to take, I guess you would say, I mean, also czarist Russia. I mean, you know, a, a common misperception of, of modern people is that Russia is, you know, one singular ethnic group of, of people in one nation. And that's not the case at all. In fact, Russia has always been, you know, multi-ethnic and pluralistic in that sense, um, even today. So, um, let's see here. USSR started by with minorities in positions of power. Polish guy was the head of the NKVD, probably killed more Soviets than our army during the war with the Bolsheviks. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm not uh, disagreeing there. That's essentially the bio-Leninist uh, coalition. Um, you basically you take any single person who has a grievance against the current order for any reason and you try to recruit them to your cause yeah uh dan asked me what aspects of liberalism that wasn't completely paused so what, what, what i mean by that is is that it, there was an ideological drive to sort of avoid the very things that were ironically that we complain about liberalism now especially in the sort of reactionary crowd um 
the, the very things that we complain about in liberalism weren't, I mean, they were there, but they weren't as present because in fact, in part, because you had the Soviet union who was now this sort of authoritarian regime that we, we complained about. So when you hear a lot of right righties nowadays complain that like, Oh, you know, how dare you complain about China when all the things that we complain about China are happening here in the, so are here on the USA shores. Um, when the Soviet union was around that, wasn't as prevalent. I mean, it, it was becoming prevalent because post 1960s, right? The things got worse, but you had a much, it, it wasn't as bad is what I'm trying to say. There, there was an ideological reason in, in competing against these ideologies and these civilizations that existed at the time. I mean, things have only gotten worse because you now have a mechanism to ensure empire. So whether that's democratization or, you know, um, woke universalism, but it, it, I, it wasn't as bad prior to is what I'm trying to say. And uh, Malthus 999 says AA did on a stream. Stalin was pretty based due to his re-Russification of Russia and purging away the bankers and New Yorkers out of the party. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well, we're, I mean, we're kind of doing that. It's kind of happening here. We've, we've, all the bankers don't want to participate with those who voted to challenge the results. So it's like, good. We don't want the bankers. We don't want Wall Street. Right. This is the best thing. The best thing that come out of January 6th is the separation of the corporations from the establishment Republican Party in a lot of aspects. Yeah. It's also interesting because, um, you know, it's um, we talk about the leftist hypocrisy and we could go on all day. But, you know, it's 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 very interesting how that's been um, noticed, how it's like, OK, well, you guys aren't actually really Bolshevik in any real manner. You guys don't actually care about that. That's not the angle anymore. Um, the angle is now the race politics. So you don't actually care about uh, siding with, you know, the banker fat cats and all the you know corporate overlords. Yeah, exactly. And what, what you know, ironically, this is where Jonathan Pohl, I think, has been really on with his bio Stalinism thing, because you, you've got the the bio Leninism from Spandrel, where we have all these low class sort of low IQ people who should not be in power, know they shouldn't be in power, wield power, and then you know identify the the racial kulak that we've discussed with um uh with with Pohl talking about bio Stalinism. So it's like okay, we we've shot chaser and this is how we're going to see civilizational collapse mm, what to do what to do yeah that's that's where we're at now is dealing and, and i think the the thing in, in the comparing other civilizations in in decline is been interesting especially when we talk with other political commentators on twitter and youtube and elsewhere is that um there will be pushback. Will it, the question becomes, will it be too late? And that, I, that'll be the, the real, real test. I almost get the feeling um, like, and, and again, this is uh, going back to uh, AA and Charlemagne stream on the fourth turning. I almost get the feeling like once the powers that be um, start to get threatened by the woke nonsense and they figure out that, Oh, actually um, I can't just, you know, uh, play up the woke nonsense in order to maintain my position. Once they realize that, oh, I, my bread is buttered on, you know, I guess the uh, traditionalist rights side of things, uh, our side of things, then they will start to uh, change their tune. And that's when you'll start to see things really shift over. Because right now it's, it's, you know, you have this weird alliance that's being maintained artificially and uh, it can't last forever. And, you know, it just depends on, you know, it could go either way. It really could. And uh, I'm, yeah, I'm just, I think uh, that it, it's more likely that uh, eventually the powers that be will figure out um, that, you know, this is, that's not in their interest and they're going to have to make some concessions. Yeah. Um, but let's talk about, now that we've spent some time sort of criticizing uh, the areas in which Huntington got wrong and uh, expressing some of our thoughts, um, I wanted to talk about some of the things that Huntington got right and then take some questions and maybe we can wrap it up. Um, so one of the things that I thought Huntington got correct is what he called uh, fault line conflicts. These, um, 
Yeah, uh, fault line conflicts are on a local level and occur between adjacent states belonging to different civilizations or within states that are home to populations of different civilizations. And I thought that that couldn't be more accurate, um, especially within the last couple of years um, when we talk about, uh, you know, things that have taken place in the Balkans. Uh, Ukraine is the best example. That is the perfect example of a um, fault line conflict between sort of the orthodoxy desire to have that Russian core state buffer zone versus the West's wishing to push on with the expansion of NATO and the European project. Yeah, it's also uh, very disconcerting. I mean, back to the Islam question in in Europe, um, from a position of uh, decline, that's very worrying simply because you've got now a civilizational fault line in basically every Western core state due to Islam and mass migration. So. Hmm. Uh, and it's only going to create internal struggles as well, which will probably only further along the decline that we see here in the West. Um, Red, White, and Ben says, what's this about? This is, uh, we're having a little conversation about a book called Clash of Civilizations by Samuel P. Huntington, published in 1996, talking about his ideas of examining the world through a civilizational lens rather than just a nation state one. So we're talking about the book, the things that he said, what we like about it, what he got right, what he got wrong. And uh, having a good old time. So welcome. Yeah, um, I just dropped yeah. a link in my Discord channel, which is why it, pretty late, 85 minutes into the stream, and I dropped the link. But no yeah. worries. Happy to have you all here. Um, but uh, no, so like I think that the fault line conflict is definitely true because we're also seeing this in the, the Middle East as well, right? Like a, a great fault line conflict when we take a look at that map again that I had brought up on screen. Uh, Libya is an excellent example of a fault line conflict because you're so close to Europe and you're so close to the Middle East. Like that was a perfect example of, um, you know, these border states having conflicts between these civilizational outlines. Well, yeah. what about like uh, even better is uh, is Sudan, South Sudan. And, oh yeah, uh, yeah. I, wholeheartedly yeah, between the African and Islamic civilizations. Yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. I mean, and South then, Sudan uh, is a Christian nation, right? And, and you know, Sudan is, I mean, they were one and then they split up in 2011. And, um... and and let's apply this also to other places too, like say India and Pakistan. I mean, that's a massive civilizational fault line between the Islamic and the Hindu civilization. I mean, just that the amount of conflict in that area alone is just ridiculous. Yep, and that's something that even Huntington pointed out in that uh, that that line graph of more conflict is between Islam and India, and I mean we're seeing that now between the constant sparring over Kashmir and the Himalayan mountains, it, yeah. it's not going away anytime soon. Yeah. So I, what's, I was, what's he call it? He calls it uh, Islam's bloody borders, if I remember correctly. Yes, he yeah he called it the bloody border, and they keep fighting. And he he anticipates that India and Pakistan will continue to fight in the Kashmiri region for years to come, and they have been. There's been numerous hot fire conflicts that have happened. Thankfully, nothing's gone nuclear, but um, well, which is why China's been getting so quick to try and broker border peace agreements between the two countries. Yeah, yeah but that's kind of falling that. apart. Yeah, that's falling apart in its own sense because China and India have border disagreements and border clashes on a regular basis now. I think it yes, other... yeah, and they but they've they've tried to mitigate that with borders joint border security agreements to mitigate the likelihood of conflict because I mean these are two nuclear armed states that have over a billion yeah. people. Yeah, the last mm -hmm. thing we really need is two nuclear armed states. Well, f firstly, I India has um, you know two civilizational fault lines on its borders both with nuclear armed states and uh, you know, pretty frightening stuff to be in, in that situation, I think. Yeah. Um, but yeah. the other aspect that he talks about along with these intercivilizational conflicts is that you have fault line, which we talked about, and then core state conflicts, which are on a global level between major states of different civilizations, core state conflicts can arise out of fault line conflicts when core states become involved. And I mean, what a better example of core state conflicts than the Middle East being this core state conflict between like China, the Orthodoxy, Russia, and the West. Like what a what a better I mean, example of core state conflict than right there. Absolutely, and then of course you have the the um, inter um, 
uh, struggle for dominance in the uh, Middle East as well. You just got all of those different, you know, every single um, Islamic core state that's competing to be the, the hegemon of the region is essentially being backed by a foreign power. And just every sing, everybody else is like convulsing, on, converging on, on each other. Exactly. And that's where we're, and I, like I said, like there's a lot he gets right. And there's a lot he gets wrong, but I mean, I think Huntington provides a really important uh, way for us to look at the world because the, the nation state is a uniquely Western concept that is born out of centuries of European infighting um, that kind of gets brokered out in the treaty of Westphalia. And um, now, you know, not everyone else is, I mean, everyone else now, of course, is a nation state because of the, the dominance of how the liberal system of the West has come out of the post-war world. But I mean, there's yeah. so much for us to look at in terms of um, civilization, yeah. ethnicity, and culture. Yeah, and, and on the ethnicity problem, I mean, um, I almost feel like like um, the, this is a common critique that Huntington talks about of, of the left against you know the decolonization efforts, you know, because basically every single... Um, a place in, in Africa and in the Middle East, basically every place where there was Western colonization, they all just essentially made very, very arbitrary borderlines. And um, a part of the reason why the conflicts in, in the Middle East and Africa have been so fierce is because the border lines do not uh, correspond to where the actual ethnic groups are, like, say, the Kurds in Iraq. Well, yeah, the, 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 the Treaty of Sykes-Picot or the Sykes-Picot Treaty of 1916 is one of the most damning and damaging aspects of foreign policy that Europe has ever done because it carved up the borders of what exists of modern day, the Middle Eastern countries. And you're absolutely right. They ignored cultural and ethnic lines and religious lines. And this is why we're seeing such vast sectarian conflict, both intrastate and interstate conflict. Yeah. Although that's probably, I think we can thoroughly blame the progressives on that one. Let's just all blame Wilson. That seems to be a popular solution. <laughs> I will always blame Wilson, and I will always blame his wife, who was our first female president. So true. <laughs> um, but yeah, and then some of the other things uh, to cl just sort of jump around um, with some of the reasons why civil Huntington's six explanations as to why civilizations will clash. And even he outlines this at the beginning of the book. One, differences among civilizations are too basic in that civilizations are differentiated each other by history, language, culture, tradition, and most importantly, religion. These fundamental differences are a product of centuries and the foundations of different civilizations, meaning they will not be gone soon. I think that we can I think we can all agree with that is that you know the differences are not too basic they are indeed very complex and nuanced based on culture and tradition and religion. Yeah. All right, number 2. The world is becoming a smaller place and as a result interactions across the world are increasing which intensify civilizational consciousness and the awareness of differences between civilizations commonalities within civilizations. And I, I agree with this, and I think that we're seeing it, especially here on the West, as we look inward as the civilizational consciousness, especially amongst ethnic lines in the West. Yeah, yeah I mean, that, that's, um, that's been evident since the late 19th century. That yeah. The, the, the closeness of the world has been increasing. Yep. Number three, due to economic modernization and social change, people are separated from long-standing social identities. Instead, religion has replaced this gap, which provides a basis for identity and commitment that transcends national boundaries and unites civilizations. And I think the biggest one that he was talking about was the Serbian conflict when you had a lot of Middle Eastern countries sort of um, take the side of the Muslims, despite the fact that there was no sort of national relations between these countries other than the, the religious role. Yeah, it's funny how that worked out. It's very interesting. And it's also very interesting, um, if I remember correctly, um, was, was the United States, um, my history is a little fuzzy in, this, in the early 90s, um, wasn't the United States backing the Serbs? Well, uh, there was eventually NATO intervention in the area, but I mean, it did not yeah. stop a lot of mass killing at the time. Yeah, yeah, but but the, it's funny how the the West and the, the liberal power basically um, backed uh, 
another civilization, essentially back to their civilizational block, which I just found in like totally like strange and uh, backwards. Mm -hmm. Um, anything you want to add to that DC? No, not off the top of my head. Okay. Uh, number four, the growth of civilizational consciousness is enhanced by the dual role of the West. On one hand, the West is at the peak of its power, but at the same time, a return to the roots phenomenon is occurring amongst non-Western civilizations. A West at its peak of its power confronts non-Western countries and increasingly have a desire, the will, and the resources to shape the world in non-Western ways. And uh, in the book, he talks about this mainly through Islamic resurgence and uh, the Japanese, because the Japanese have been increasingly, you know, ha have, of course, historically resisted Western intervention until Commodore Perry in the 1850s, but not to mention the fact that the Japanese have managed to out, you know, outpace a lot of other Western countries in terms of their economic growth during the 1970s and 80s and 90s. Um, you know, telling the West that, you know, you need to be more like the Japanese instead of the Japanese being more like the West. Yeah, that's interesting. The other thing that I get out of this is um, essentially I, I almost view the cultural resurgence that is happening in certain places in the West. Mm -hmm. um, it's almost like um, the, the costs of the current ruling ideology of, of universalist universalism uh, have to be um, laid bare before and it, essentially it has to go before we can have that that uh, resurgence and I think that that due to the actions of the cathedral and, and the willingness to maintain power at all costs it's going to have to be a, a hard reset in that regard they're going to have to suffer some pretty significant blows before people start waking up to the fact that oh actually I need to go back to tradition and, and my civilizational benefits yeah and i mean he, that was one of the bigger chapters in huntington's book was talking about the islamic resurgence of exactly just that yeah didn't he also mention uh the islamic resurgence um being a sort of uh response to the west and um instead of deciding to westernize like the turkish elite they decided to go down the uh islamic route if i'm not mistaken uh, I mean, yeah, I think that's in the, the same chapter. Yeah, just thought I'd mention it. Um, number five. Cultural characteristics and differences are less mutable and hence less easily compromised and resolved than political and economic ones. Um, and the, Huntington really goes into depth about that when he's talking about uh, economic unions and trying to have trade cooperation because... You can try and trade and have interdependence upon one another, but unless you can come over those linguistic and cultural differences, it's going to be incredibly difficult to do so. And his biggest example was um, the slowdown of the Caribbean, you know, nation sort of organization that he was talking about in, I think, chapter four. Yeah, well, here's an interesting thing about that, too, with the cultural divide and and. This is also goes back to the north-south divide in, in Europe itself of, of why the European Union as a project, as an economic and political project, is probably doomed to failure in the long term, um, just because the you know that sort of Mediterranean uh, cultural difference with the Nords, um, and then also because Greece is uh, technically an Orthodox country, and you know the majority of the EU is you know uh, Western, so you have this weird cultural. Um, divide there between the Orthodox and the West inside of the EU. So that makes things very, very difficult for them to sustain long-term given that particular fact. Yeah. yeah. And there's been a lot of internal strife between Greece and the rest of the EU for multiple reasons. Yeah. Specifically, I'm, I'm also thinking of the 2008 crisis too, because the Europe had to bail the heck out of them. Right. Yeah, and not to mention that, I mean, we're, we're already seeing it. The, the fault lines take place along the NATO-Warsaw Pact lines of the European Union. You're, you're seeing uh, much more Warsaw Pact countries drift further away from the EU. And, I mean, not only just for Russia's ethnic reasons, but also simply because it's ideologically not what they see. I mean, you have the inter-civilizational conflict because w what is the European Union other than organized Germanism by another name? And of course, you have countries like 
Poland being a little skeptical of that. They're like not going to fall for that again. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, last but not least, number six, uh, economic regionalism is increasing. Successful economic regionalism will reinforce civilizational consciousness. Economic regionalism may succeed only when it is rooted in common civilization. Um, Correct. And Correct. We, are, we are seeing that now. The, the regionalism will only create these... For, and this is why I think that the European project will fail is because the Europe is too stratified civilizationally to, to have a, an overarching European project with the ability to raise taxes and have a military. It's just not going to work. Correct. That has not been the model of European success in the past. European success depends on, on competition between other European powers in order to actually be um, civilizationally uh, expansive. Indeed. So with that being said, I think that that sort of, there's a few things he gets wrong, but I mean, this was written in 1996 and we've got, you know, 20, uh, 25 years now to uh, look back and uh, take a look at the world. And so there's quite a few things he got right, a few things he got wrong, and a few things that I think he generalized on. But overall, I think this was a really good book. And he cites quite a few people that many on the right should definitely take notice of, Spangler being one of them. So I think this is a, a book I would happily recommend. This was a very good read. And um, I, I, if you haven't read the book already in the chat, I highly recommend that you pick up a copy. You can find the original article online. Um, it's a 28-page uh, read, and it sort of outlines sort of the, the bare essentials of his thesis in the book, and I highly recommend it. I got my copy for $9.99. Yeah, I just wish political class would, would read more of this book. I mean, so many of our problems would just be solved if, if this as a, like, was taught at, on a textbook level, which that might be something we have to do <laughs> in the future. Right. This well, this, the, the, right. And the real problem is realist theory versus, you know, like I can't even remember. It's escaped my mind, but this is realist theory. I mean, this is a realistic view of international relations. And for some reason they just, you know, they just don't follow that in Washington, DC. They have this just warped perception of how the world operates. Well, and, and keep in mind that the, the, the way that the world operates in their view, of course, is through the universalist perspective. And this is something that Huntington does criticize. Correct. Exactly. Um, and I, I wish that um, I think I should say, I think that this is a good book to start off with. Like if you want to launch into kind of geopolitics, um, I think this is a decent book for that. Um, just reading more about it, at least. And yeah, I, on that note, though, I will definitely look up the the on the plurality of civilizations from Felix Konensky. I will definitely be sure to add that one to my list. Um, but with that being said, are there any questions from the chat? And if so, we'll take a few of them. And um, if not, we'll we'll wrap it up there with some announcements, and I'll have everybody shill for themselves. Not to mention, you can shill for me. I now have a subscribe star link that's working. So if anyone's interested, it's down below in the description. But overall, I'm really thankful that you guys could come on. This was a fantastic conversation. And I hope for next uh, or this month's Prudent Reads, I can also have us all come on and talk about Bronze Age mindset. That'll be a fun time. What's it about? What's I don't about? know if I want to read that book. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't necessarily know either. I know that Bronze Age Pervert has got this just idea of uh, re reject sort of the, the traditional way of looking at liberalism and going for it. And uh, He's a cultured grug. Yeah. Well, I, yeah I, he take, I, he's, I, he's based in grug pilled. I'm excited. I unfollowed him on Twitter because he was just spamming the whole feed lot the other night. And I was like, it was weird stuff too. Talk about nudism. And I was like, ah. Oh, uh, okay. well, he, he's, <laughs> it's his whole shtick. He's this like nudist bodybuilding, body embrace the, the Nietzsche and Ubermensch kind of mentality. Mm -hmm. But yeah, he's but, very similar uh, to the Golden I, West. 
I've I've been told that Brian's age mindset is like reading a like grug pilled 4chan green text that just goes on for way too long. So I'm kind of excited. Oh, okay. um, <laughs> it sounds kind of something like Steve Franson would write. His books are a lot like that. Uh, so yeah, that'll be that'll be next. <laughs> That's I, I my copy came in this weekend. I I've been told it's a very quick read. I invited Clossington to come on, so he and I for sure will be. Uh, talking about that in a couple of weeks, so it'll be fun. Um, Melthus says, the prudentialist American exceptionalism flows both ways. For example, in the mentality that democracy is good and that they can make everybody liberal democratic, or be liberal dem uh, democracies. Yep, that's um, basically yeah. mentality right there in a nutshell. I, yeah, that, that's the problem with American exceptionalism is, is that we, we are we're the, we're the exception to the rule, however we can make everybody also the exception. Um, <laughs> that was the critique. Yeah, that was the um, a big critique of universalism was treating everybody with the same, um, you know, the same philosophy, and then Chinese being like, "Okay, that's nice. We're gonna stab you in the back now." Uh, then, Dan asks, "Does he mention anything about how the internet could affect things?" Uh, he definitely does. When he talks about the world being a smaller place, he talks about the rise of the internet and how that's going to definitely change the way that we communicate more instantaneously, not to mention it's going to affect international trade and make us aware that of how people are different in our engagement with the rest of the world. And he also talks about language being a, a way of you know communicating with one another. Um, so it's mentioned, but keep in mind that this was... Yeah, if only he knew how bad things would be, because this was written in 1996. Yeah. So the the internet was a much different place, and he yeah. didn't live to see what how how the internet was used in these West solutions in the Middle East, and Ukraine, and now in Belarus and and in Myanmar, which is happening right now. I mean, it was trending like all day the other day about how, and you can look at the tr trending tab for this Myanmar coup that everybody was talking about, and it was like the same six accounts tweeting from other sides of the country like okay so this is obviously a very centralized uh, organized attempt to get this on the trending tab and to uh, interesting stuff yeah i mean he died in 2008 so i the the real thing is going to be about right you know like he did see sort of the early rise of the internet playing a role especially in elections how we saw on the united states with barack obama getting elected but yeah, Dan Normie, you're absolutely correct about uh, cyber warfare being a big aspect of modern warfare. It just goes back to the fourth generation warfare concept. You know, if I can convince you not to fight or if I can convince you to do something that is against your interests, then obviously I'd never have to actually go to battle with you. The unfortunate part about that is, well, it's very, very dishonest. And it's from the Western mindset, that's incredibly dishonest because we prefer direct confrontation. So... And as, and as Alchi said best, all of this could have been avoided if we had a fair conversation about the standards of ethics in gaming journalism. Indeed, I just wanted to game. <laughs> yeah, just that's all. I just wanted to play video games, man. Um, the real question is, how will crypto affect things? Uh, that's what Great Light Wobster asks. So that's actually a fun question because I think that crypto will... It's we are watching it play out in real time. I think there was a fun interview from the mayor of I think it was Miami, uh, Luis Suarez or whatever his name is. Yes. He was talking about how he wants the city to embrace crypto. And it's like, yeah, Janet Yellen can't control it. So why? Of course, they're going to be upset. Um, the question is whether or not it takes off on an international scale. And if it becomes international and you can have alternative institutions of trade of this digital currency like take place, then I think it will have a significant impact on how um, global economies react because the nation states are going to have a much harder time competing against things that have significantly higher value than their traditional fiat based currencies. So we'll see how it goes. Yeah, it's almost. I, I would suggest if if crypto crypto actually takes off, I'd say that um, you know obviously the dollar is going to decline unless they do something about the fiat currency situation, I, like going back to a more uh, hard form of currency to, as a you know, to compete with it. Um, I assuming that they're not because that would also mean that all of these uh, liberal projects and things that we're paying for uh, are going to go the way of the dodo because you're going to have to have the budget conversation real quick. Um, I would also imagine that 
if assuming Bitcoin is successful, then, you know, you can, as Prudential said, you can essentially make your own alternative economy that nobody can control and nobody can really regulate. And uh, that's going to be bad for um, America's geopolitical future, uh, because obviously our geopolitical power in part comes from our soft power of the dollar. Um, so if the dollar is no longer the world's reserve currency, well, then obviously a major part of our geopolitical influence goes away. So um, I mean, which is actually from our perspective of our cause, that's actually very good because um, if, you know, people don't trust the dollar, then, you know, they'll be able to, um, um, we won't have as much global homo in the world. Yep. I'm right there with you. Dan Normie says, couldn't we just write everyone a letter telling them to accept liberal universalist values from globalist Sargon? <laughs> uh, so I don't know if you were aware, Raging Mandrill, but AA had one of his unpopular opinion streams. They were talking about 3,000 Hong Kongers or 300,000 Hong Kongers can't be wrong. And the, the meme, of course, was that Sargon was saying, well, why don't we just write an open letter asking these people politely not to come? <laughs> Yes, let's write them an open letter, you know, accepting <laughs> you know, Chinese Communist Party, you know, domination of your, you know, your life. Yeah, let's totally do that. Let's see how effective that's going to be. Uh, I, I, I would love to ask him some questions. I just want to, I would like to just ask how that would work. <laughs> you know, uh, but I'm glad that it's a meme. It's a... Sargon, I mean, my intellectual journey has been such where, um, you know, Sargon comes off these days to me as as very charmingly naive in some ways, which is still fun. I was listening to his podcast this morning about C. It was almost the way he was talking about American politics um, this morning on his live or in his show. Yep, we're losing you there, DC. Uh, my internet's cutting in and out. Uh, okay. Are, are we are we here? <laughs> yeah, I'm here. I I think we lost Prudentialist. I think he said he's having connection issues. All right, go ahead and, and oh, go yeah, ahead and did. repeat what you said. Whoops. There he goes. Was, was the last stream Yeah, because your whole... Oh, yeah, it looks yeah, like I don't it. Know how stream, I don't know how StreamYards works or Streamlabs or whatever. Yeah. Okay. So what I was saying was um, there seems to be, uh, you know, I was listening to the Lotus Eaters this morning. He was talking about CPAC and his naive manner, which he discussed in politics, kind of almost cute to me. I thought it was wholesome and naive and like you were saying, just um, like, uh, sorry, God, it's, it's like, have you seen the meme of the Ninja Turtle being walked with alongside the uh, master? And then a, a, a couple years down the line, it's the Ninja Turtles walking with, um, I can't remember his name, Master Yugo or whatever. It's like the same thing. Yeah. Yeah. Sargon yeah. It, it's is funny how that's out of us. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's funny how how we're leading Sargon now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and I feel the same way. There's a lot of con congressional candidates um, on Twitter that all of like the America First populist groupers and everything are like they'll tweet something out, and then all of the America First groupers will be like, no, and then they'll retract the statement. Like we're we're kind of leading the um, the populist movement here in America, and and Sargon is like kind of a an example of that on an international scale. Yeah, funny. Well, uh, Prudentialist, if you're listening uh, in the chat, are you going to rejoin us at any time soon, or, or can we? I, I got to go. So uh, <laughs> he just leaves us. He just leaves us here to stream the whole time. <laughs> I know. Right? We can keep streaming for as long as we want on his stream. Maybe, maybe we can get him to monitor. Uh, I'm going to get your channel banned. Uh, the election was completely legitimate. <laughs> yes, I, I bow to your overlordish ways, Susan. You are, you are all, all 
all knowing Susan. Susan has some weird history, man. That's that's the truth. Really? I, I've never heard her backstory. Well, her like family ties to like uh the corporate class is like very interesting stuff. <laughs> uh, interesting. Well, I mean, for someone who's yeah. a CEO, that's I'm not surprised. Yeah, yeah right. It's, of course. I, I there was a criticism that I wanted to bring up, which was also by Keith Woods of the Clash of Civilizations, um, in a tweet which he since deleted, um, because he deletes his tweets often. I guess I can't find it, but he was basically critiquing the the Clash of Civilizations uh, worldview in saying that we're not in a Clash of Civilizations, but we're in a Clash of Corporations, and our biggest enemy is not civilizational um, enemies, but rather corporate enemies. And I wanted to know what you thought out of that. Actually, I want to give you my it, opinion, it, if that's right. It's interesting that you mentioned that. So I'm actually in the middle of reading a book called uh, Nemesis by C.A. Bond. It's published by Imperium Press, which you can find their handle on Twitter. Um, and I just re literally read the chapter on this this morning. And um, I w was struck by uh, what they were mentioning about it because they were talking about the Ford Foundation and how um, essentially um, the Ford Foundation like managed to it, fund all of these different um, uh, you know liberal projects and all of the you know think of like whatever an NGO does it's like okay I'm gonna fund this you know this study that is gonna you know back up my you know thing about this and and it was hilarious because I was like this is literally them telling um, literally how the cathedral operates in practice, right? Is okay, I'm going to have my NGO institution and it's going to create this study, which is going to back up um, my political worldview. And this politician is going to use my study in order to advance this agenda. And I just thought it was hilarious, but it's interesting of how um, like they actually go and look at, you know, um, uh, one specific example of that. Yeah, and I think it's also it's it's more than that, you know. It's like uh, sure they'll do that though, especially like um, the, the the biggest example of this is like the gasoline companies or whatever, um, doing doing this type of stuff. But yeah, it's it's also um, now we now, now it's what is it like the what do they call it stakeholder capitalism? Yeah, you use it's using philanthropy to, to advance a political agenda right. essentially. Exactly, and then and, and that's that's what. Klaus Schwab is pushing, um, and yep. but George also George. another side of this, and I think this is, what Keith, I think this is what Keith Woods was getting at when he said that the clash of civilization thing was stupid. Um, it's rather like a clash of corporations. It's it's like um, I think he was getting at the fact that it's not the corporations informing the politicians of what to do. That's so bad. But I think he was getting at the idea that the corporations now are just kind of overreaching the politicians and doing whatever the heck they want, regardless of what the politicians say. And I think that there's a lot of truth yeah. to that. Yeah, yeah, there is there is a, a sense, I think, that's growing about um, people who um, are getting a little too big for their britches. And, and I think that a lot of the CEOs of corporations are probably doing that. And I'm, I mean, I, I'm not sure I, I quite like Keith Woods. I, I'm not, I don't like his corner of politics, um, just because I'm, I'm economically I mean, closer to but um yeah you know those those guys do have some interesting things to say once in a while so i do listen to them on occasion yeah yeah and I, this is one of my pet peeves whenever we talk about somebody we have to say oh, no i don't agree with them on everything but it's like this is something that joe rogan does <laughs> and the eric weinsteins do all the time and i just like no duh you oh, don't yeah. agree with them on everything like it's obvious you don't yeah. agree with them on everything you don't have to say it every time you, you mention someone's name um you know but anyways that's just my pet peeve uh, but the yeah. my thought what of Ford it is, Foundation, oh hold on, Ouchie has a question. Uh, oh, what okay. Ford Foundation would fund today if it was run by Henry Ford? Uh, I am I am not sure. Uh, I'm sure if it was the um, the it'd probably be a lot more based in Red Pill than whatever yeah. they're funding today. I'm sure. So the world Ford were alive today. No, um, I think that. The clash of civilization things, clash of corporations things, I think it can both be true. I think the corporation issue is more on the domestic front, um, whereas the Correct. civilizational issue is more on the geopolitical front. But also you have the, but 
but the the keyword, you know, there's a lot of multinational corporations as well. I almost view the multinational corporations as um, it's almost like how do I put it this way? Yeah, they they all push the, the same global homo agenda, but it's almost like um, uh, I view them as like ugh, how do I put this? What well, since they all have um, they're all multinational, right? They all employ multinationals. Some of them like. Um, don't even have their headquarters in the United States anymore, even though they're technically considered American companies. Um, it's almost like they're they're a foreign entity that um, should be viewed as kind of like a foreign power. Like, you know, if you view them as as powers unto themselves, that that does kind of start to make a little more sense in that regard. So, yeah, 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 totally. I, I agree. I mean, and that's what they are at this point. I hate it too, DC. Yes, so true. Thank you. Someone someone understands my pain when people say, I don't necessarily agree with them on everything. Joe Rogan does this a lot whenever he talks about with like Alex Jones or whatever. It's like, yeah, we know Rogan. Well, I he, don't know if know. he's... Go, Go ahead. ahead. Oh, I was going to say, I don't know if he's coming back. Joe Rogan, oh, Prudentialist? Probably not. <laughs> <laughs> he's not back by now. I don't know what's going on. So uh, his, you know, lives on the boonies or whatever. I mean, I, I'm I'm running on shit internet right now, so I don't know. But me too. Um, uh, I don't necessarily agree with everything DC Perspective says, but he's right about that. Thank you, Michael. So true. <laughs> um, they've commandeered your channel. It's true. Uh, it looks like he ended the stream, uh, or at least yeah. that's what he said on Twitter. Two minutes ago, but I think it's still going. Or am I tripping? Let me check the live. I mean, it's, it still says live. I'm still showing live in the upper corner of my my thing. So, I mean, I just leave. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I I I guess. I mean, it's over. <laughs> yeah. All right, all right, everybody, get out, get out now. <laughs> Oh, I'm the only one here now. How do I leave? I don't know how to I don't know how to use this application.